A very good afternoon to all our guests from Europe. Good morning to those logging in from the US and Canada. Um, good evening to our friends from uh, Middle East Africa, India, Southeast Asia, and also good evening to our friends from New Zealand and Australia. Um, it gives me great pleasure to uh, start our third seminar in the seminar series on the digital future for business and society, perspectives on artificial intelligence, challenges and opportunities. This entire seminar series, which is a series of 15 seminars, it is hosted jointly by Professor Yogesh Divedi, and we have the pleasure of having him uh, on our uh, session today. Uh, so Professor Yogesh Divedi is from the Emerging Markets Research Center, EMARC for short, Department of Business, School of Management, Swansea University, UK. Co-host is also Professor Dr. Ramakrishnan Raman, uh, our director at uh, Symbiosis Institute of Business Management, Pune, which is a constituent of Symbiosis International Deemed University. This entire seminar series is supported by the Center for Technology, Innovation, Management and Enterprise called TIME in short, as an acronym. The University of Kent, UK, Digital Marketing and Analytics Special Industry Group, Academy of Marketing, Grenoble IE Graduate School of Management, a Grenoble INP school of the University of Grenoble Alps, Swansea iLab, Innovation Lab, Swansea University, the e-business and e-government special industry group, British Academy of Management, and the UK Academy of Information Systems, known as UKs, uh, in short. This seminar series is inspired by various perspectives on AI and its transformative potential, which were presented in a recent perspective article by Divedi et al. 2019. AI offers a huge transformative potential for the augmentation and even potential replacement of human tasks and activities within a wide range of industrial, intellectual, and social applications. In fact, the pace of change for this new AI technological age is staggering with new breakthroughs in algorithmic machine learning and autonomous decision-making, creating new opportunities for continuous innovations. The impact of AI is wide ranging industries, sectors ranging from agriculture, finance, fintech, healthcare, manufacturing, retail, supply chain, logistics, and utilities, all potentially can be disrupted by AI. So this seminar series will present various perspectives from a number of leading expert speakers to highlight the challenges and opportunities posed by the rapid emergence of AI. Professor Yogesh Devedi is a professor of digital marketing and innovation, founding director of the Emerging Markets Research Center and co-director of research at the School of Management, Swansea University, Wales, UK. He's also currently leading the International Journal of Information Management as its editor-in-chief. Professor Ramkrishnan Raman is director at SIVM Pune, India, and uh, he is dean faculty of management and a keen researcher. Uh, one additional very interesting soundbite for all of you, Professor uh, Raman has been very recently awarded uh, his first patent in the area of AI and automation in the retail point of sale sector very recently, just about uh, two weeks ago. So I just thought I would share that data point uh, with you. Allow me now to introduce our speaker for today, Professor Dr. Maureen Janssen, Professor of ICT and Governance, Delft University of Technology, the Netherlands. One of the most iconic institutions in engineering education in the whole world if I can uh, use that uh, uh, description. The title of his uh, talk today will be on adaptive governance 
of trustworthy artificial intelligence. Professor Dr. Marine Janssen is a full professor in ICT and governance at the Information and Communication Technology Research Group of the Technology, Policy and Management Faculty of Delft University of Technology. I think popularly uh, the institute is called TU Delft, if I'm not mistaken. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Professor Janssen. Uh, Professor Janssen is co-editor-in-chief of Government Information Quarterly, chair of the IFIP WG 8.5 in ICT and Public Administration, conference chair of IFIP e-government CDEM e-part series, and he has been nominated in 2018 and 2019 by Apolitical as one of the 100 most influential people in the digital government space worldwide. So with that, um, I would now like to hand over the floor to Professor Janssen for his talk on the adaptive governance of trustworthy artificial intelligence. Professor Janssen, the floor is all yours. Welcome. Thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction. I hope you're able to see my slides uh, now and I yes. will uh, hear me yes. very well. Thank, sure. thank you. From, uh, well, like it's also already introduced, I, I want to talk a little bit about especially the adaptive governance of uh, AI. And what we see is that AI, like I said at the introduction, is entering our lives. It's almost everywhere and we can't do it uh, without it anymore. Huh? It's in your smartphone, you have all kinds of uh, AI in your laptops, but it's also in your daily life without knowing it, it might direct you or guide you that. And there are a lot of uh, different views on uh, AI and often the rationality uh, is dominating. The rationality of we make everything faster, quicker, better, smarter and uh, those kinds of things with that. But there's also always, as always with automation, and there's nothing AI specific about that, there are also some yeah, undesired effects that you don't want or you didn't think about it. And there are a couple of ways to deal with those in undesired uh, effect. And one of them is by looking at the governance, by ensuring that you have the right controls, the right mechanisms, the right responsibilities in place to interact and intervene when something is not uh, going well. And you know in advance that uh, there will be something that's not uh, going well. That's why we have IT governance, that's why we have uh, corporate go governance and those kinds of things. And in this field, I think it's, it's primarily important to be adaptive. Adaptive because AI is also changing all the time. Also the embedding, the data sources are also changing uh, all the time. And that means we have to adapt. And then why I would like to talk about trustworthiness of uh, AI is uh, that a lot of people talk about fairness, they talk about explainability, interpretability, and those kinds of issues. But I think trustworthiness is much more important. And I will also try to explain that in this uh, lecture, that for example, explainability is very difficult because explainability might look very attractive at first glance, like transparency, very attractive, but very hard to achieve. So it's better to focus on the trustworthiness of uh, AI. And I also want to give you some uh, guidance uh, for them. And at the end, I want to talk uh, about, of course, further research uh, with that, because this is the Digital Future series, uh, of course. To give you an uh, example to start with, that's Siri. It uh, was a system in the Netherlands. It's called System Risk Identification for that. And what it did, it contained a lot of public data from public organizations, put it together, and then it used for detecting fraud. And what happens when you put a lot of data uh, together? Well, everybody becomes a potential subject. So everybody is in one way or another investigated because you collect the data of everybody, you put it uh, together. Then you use some black box AI models, machine learning type of uh, uh, model to look at who is conducting fraud. And what happens? Well, it, it might not be surprisingly that neighborhoods with low incomes, there might be some more people who are conducting fraud. And what happens with this system is that looks at the whole neighborhood and said that neighborhood might conduct fraud and it becomes 
suspect uh, in that. So they become under investigated in the in, in the investigation with that. Although you can explain where the data is coming from because you know, know the public sources where it's coming uh, from for public organizations, not public sources, private sources, of course, but owned by pu public organizations. You can look at the algorithms, how they work. You can even explain why they, uh, they look at low income uh, neighborhoods, uh, for example, because it makes absolutely sense when you would ask people to do it, they all, or also knew that uh, there would be more fraud of it. But the results, are not acceptable by society. Why is it not uh, acceptable uh, with that? Well, somebody's innocent till there's proof. And the system is saying from, oh, you're potential fraudulent, but there's no proof for that. Only some uh, kind of uh, data that you're similar or you live in a similar low income neighborhood in this uh, example, but there's no proof that you actually uh, conducted fraud. So what's happening with this system is that everybody is considered as a potential fraudulent. Well, people didn't like the system. I don't know if you followed the news, but also um, questions from the United Nations from does this not violate the human rights? And the conclusions was, yes, it violates the human rights uh, for that. When you look at the uh, link below, you can also look at the English uh, uh, overview uh, of it. And they stopped the system. And I think it's a good thing that they stopped uh, the system. But what is the problem with this system? Because you can explain it, you know the data uh, sources. So what is really underlying the problem uh, of it? Why didn't it work out? Well, in my opinion, is they didn't think about it well because we always use data. We can always explain the algorithms with that, but we have to look at the whole system, also the governance of the system. And if it's desired what we're doing, we have also to look at the public values uh, for doing it. And although the initial idea might be good because we want to use data for looking at who's potential fraud, how it was implemented, Collecting data of all persons is, of course, completely wrong because then everybody becomes a suspect. That's the whole foundation from the start of this project is already wrong. So that's why we have also to look at data. And I know I presented uh, this picture for some of you uh, before, but it's so important to understand the role of data. Data are symbols. Data reflects something in reality and we determine uh, what is collected for that. So we don't collect everything about the reality, but also only some parts of it, what we looked at it. And then I always say, take your glasses, you put a certain view on it. The view is determined by the data. The data shows what you want to see. Well, if you want to use data, you have to understand where it's coming from and the interpretations. We, just before we had a discussion about uh, the, the snow and the freezing and those kinds of things, well, that's the temperature uh, now. For farmers, it's very important to know if it's freezing on the land or it's freezing a couple of meters above the uh, level. So where you measure your temperature is crucial to know it. So if you say the temperature is one degree and you measure two meters above uh, the land level with that, it might be actually freezing at the land level because it's colder uh, when you get lower uh, with that. Well, it might disrupt your whole harvest or it might uh, uh, stop your flowers with that. It might be devastating with that. That's why you have to know how the data is collected. Once you have the data, you need to analyze it and analyze it, you can only look at the data. That's what data scientists do, they have data crunchers. They only look at the data, but the data might be wrong. You get a model out of it. You have to validate it. You have to go to reality and therefore knowledge about that reality is uh, needed. And what kind of knowledge is needed if you look at fraud and inspection and those kinds of things? Of course, those people would do the inspection, inspectors in this case, they need to validate uh, the, the knowledge with the reality because they know what can be gained from the data. Sometimes we get some outcome that doesn't make any sense uh, of it. I didn't have any examples in this presentation, but uh, you know the famous example that pregnant uh, women live closer to the sea. Well, they conducted that in Sweden and uh, where everybody living in Sweden near the sea. 
and not in the inland because it's rocky and uh, those kinds of things. So it, you have to know the content to understand why this is the reason for it and doesn't make any sense to draw a sense to draw that conclusion. And, and that's why we as researchers need theorizing with that. Well, you interpret it, the data, and then you use uh, the data, of course, to influence reality. You take measures and that reality in turn, you collect the data. So it's a loop also. Eh? It doesn't stop at the end with the usage because you influence reality and you start over again. It's a dynamics. It's a continuously cycle because if you find out I didn't collect the right data, you should change your collection of the data. If you influence uh, reality, you want to know the effects. That's what policymakers are also doing. Eh? In the policymaking cycle, you always have policy evaluation. Why do you have that? Because you know it has a certain effects. And you also know, policymakers at least know, that a lot of policies don't have the desired effect. That's why you need to evaluate and to update it uh, for that all the time. So understanding what is really the meaning of the data is uh, key with that. And then what we're doing in the AI area, we uh, combine more and more data together. And that increases the complexity of the data, uh, the data protection, but also the data pro processing. Because with one data source, it's easy yeah? measuring the temperature. You can look at how it's measured. But imagine that you have various type of data sources uh, with that, about the taxes in this case, about your municipality, your services, the licenses, you all combine that together. What does it say combining it together? What you're doing is you create a fuzzy picture on reality. You don't know it anymore. And then you have also the right for privacy, yeah? personal information collection is always a little bit uh, tricky because you don't want to violate the privacy of the people. Eh? You don't want to already ensure that you know that what kind of uh, party they're voting on or something uh, like that. Then you have security issues. People, oh, they love the data because they can use the data. Eh? Amazon was saying for we can already predict what you're going to buy and we deliver it already before you book it, before you uh, use your system so you can find it already. Well, that's of course a dream of most of the companies with that, but highly undesired for that, unless it's for certain purposes and you need the proper governance on it that it apply with the, uh, with the rules that are acceptable by society uh, for that. And what we also should forget when we have a database, we're quite happy if the quality, the information quality of a database is 90, 95% then we are quite happy with those kinds of uh, levels of information quality. But that means also that a couple of percent is not correct. There might be all kinds of errors in the personal uh, information uh, for that, uh, and that might affect it. And especially when, when we look at persons, eh, we bring it back to a specific instance, then we might have a problem. For generalization, it's fine. Eh, if you talk about the population, it's fine. But what we do nowadays with AI, we make predictive analytics and we use it for one instance, for one person. And we also know from statistics, that's often not allowed. And statistics is about the population. You make uh, some inference about the population, but it hasn't to be true for a particular instance. Well, that's a common way we deal with AI nowadays, that we're talking about one person, one instance for doing it. Well, most of the data uh, and statistics we use are not allowed to do it in uh, that way. And that's the risk of if we could have a lot of data that we even not aware what we're doing and that results easily in non-compliance. So it often starts with the, uh, the good. Huh? We want to improve our society. We want to reduce uh, fraud with them. At the end, the scope goes up. We don't have an overview of the data anymore. The complexity grows. And at the end, we make even a huge problem because we're not compliant anymore. And, and that's a problem with that. And that's why governance is also needed because you want to have an overview that you're doing the right uh, things with that. So what's happening? More data results less in the ability to protect and ensuring compliance uh, for that. And often more departments and parties are involved and that results in further fragmentations and the risk. And that make it complex. If the data is collected, used by a single person, then it's often not a problem with that, but it's the data sources 
are fragmented, scattered around with that. We don't have an overview, we combine it. We have even no clue how many times it's processed in uh, advance. So that we don't have a know the complexity uh, anymore. And when we look what's happening is that uh, when you look at the governments, well, we use it for everything eh? nowadays, AI type of things, eh? of the machine learning, but it can also be a uh, type of business rules type of uh, systems. Eh? When you look, for example, at the uh, um, IND in uh, the Netherlands, they ha have a rule based systems for the admissions of immigrants. They put the policy rules in it and uh, they make a decision of it. So the rules are in it, so it's a rule based. So it should be compliant uh, with the regulations with that. But what we also do is we use a lot of black box system for that. For example, identifying security threats on airports, uh, face recognition, but also profiling of people. And we're often quite happy with that. You also want to have a safe airport. Yeah? You also want to, uh, to travel in a secure and safe way. Of course, you're quite happy uh, with it, but you also know that there are some mistakes uh, over there. We make it for the calculation of social benefits, for your tax returns. We use AI everywhere. And the thing is also we can't do without AI. Because imagine that we don't automate it anymore. Because a lot of AI are in fact algorithms. Yeah? And it's a couple of algorithms. Yeah? It doesn't to be machine learning, but it could be pre-processed anymore. And algorithm is just the steps that are taken to make process some of the data in it. Machine learning is a type of algorithms uh, for doing that. So you take all kinds of steps uh, uh, in that in doing that. And it's not only the tool, uh, the algorithms, the machine learning we focus on, but also before what happens before, how to cleanse the data, how to deal with the data, and also what happens thereafter. So it's often a whole process, the automation process that is uh, important. That's why I prefer often to talk about computational algorithms instead of uh, AI only, because AI is only one component uh, in the whole uh, system. And algorithms should suggest also that we take the data into uh, account, because when you use the data, those are also algorithms for that. And in fact, an algorithm is also data. An AI machine learning algorithm is also data. It's written in a certain data form. So I perceive data as a, uh, a very broad way. And when we look at what can go wrong, well, it's very clear. I hope I already explained it. There can be problems in the data. And this is the famous uh, Google flu trends I show over here. Huh? Google flu uh, used that in the past to make a prediction and then it went wrong. And why did it went wrong? Because the data inputs changed. And how did it change? Well, it made a quite accurate prediction about uh, the flu because when people search for the flu, they actually had flu or at least they might have flu and they could even predict it better than the uh, GPs uh, could do it. But what happens when people find out, hey, Google knows where is the flu, also people who didn't have the flu start searching for it because I don't want to go in that direction. So the whole input data changed for that and the whole prediction didn't uh, was not accurate uh, anymore. So you have to know the input data, what you use and what's the quality of the input data. And if there are any changes in the input data, it might disrupt your whole algorithms for that. Secondly, you need to know something about the algorithms with that. And I say something on purpose because you don't have to know it all for that. Do you have a clue when uh, uh, how your smartphone works when it presents a game? or you do something on your smartphone, you don't have a clue probably how it works. You don't have need it because you know that it will do it in the way you like it for that. You don't have to have all the insight. With algorithms, you need some part of the insights of the black box, but you don't need to know it uh, completely. But you have to understand a little bit how it works. And this is the, another famous example with that. This is the Husky versus the Wolf experiment. They use some uh, training data to learn uh, machine learning algorithms to recognize a Husky and, uh, and a Wolf. And it was quite successful in uh, recognizing uh, that. I think it was higher than 90% uh, with that. Then they looked at the working of the algorithms. Well, where do you find a Husky? You might see it here, it's always in the snow. So when you leave the husky out, you can only see the white background. Where do you find a wolf? Well, not in the snow, it's often green, the background. 
So this algorithm was very smart. It look, just looked at the background. And by looking at the background, it says this is a husky and this is a wolf. It doesn't look at the faces or whatever. It just know, knew that the pictures were in the background. That's why you have to understand a little bit about how the algorithms work. And it's the same with the example of Siri I give you at the beginning. Uh, from, it's also you have to understand why the algorithms end up with selecting a wall neighborhood for uh, under suspect because it looks at certain items and you don't have to understand maybe all the in and outs of the algorithm but you have to understand what elements it takes into account with that and that's some level of explainability but you don't have to explain it all you have to have a basic understanding uh, for that and once it works properly you have of course a trustworthiness uh, in it because I don't know how you use your mobile uh, phones, all of you, but I trust that it's working well with my fingerprints or my iris scan when I open it. I'm not going to check that. I trust that. I've never looked at that algorithm, but it's working properly because it's working all the time in my uh, view. Although I also know it's not always working because it might be incorrect and you can also conduct fraud uh, with it because they can mimic uh, what you're doing here, the all kinds of ways of uh, dealing uh, with it. But I trust it and it's the same with those kinds of things. You need to trust it and to ensure that it works properly and it's all about working uh, properly and then you need some, uh, some uh, ways of dealing with it. Well, the, Many examples of the data bias uh, um, in this, uh, I have put here, there's some uh, examples uh, of it. Uh, it was in the US uh, that um, um, uh, uh, color people had a higher chance of uh, getting prisoned than uh, white people ha had. Google Translate says a doctor is a male and a nurse is a female. Amazon. Uh, recruitment didn't like uh, women, according to Reuters, uh, with that. So there are all kinds of uh, things in it, and you know they don't make any sense uh, uh, for doing it uh, with that. But what's happening? People trust the AI often more, because the reason why we are doing it is because they make more rational decisions, and they can might even do it better than humans do, and they might even be less biased than humans do, if you do it properly, of course, with that. Well, and people trust the AI decisions even better eh, when AI works with humans. So when humans are involved, they look at the decision, they even trust better the AI made uh, decisions. But we also know, for, I hope you uh, understand that the AI suffers from all kinds of problems with that inherent bias, uh, but also the design of the algorithm, how you deal with the uh, data. And that's why a lot of people look at explainable AI, uh, XAI with that as a solution with that. And explainable AI already exists for a couple of decades. Uh, and what explainable AI is doing from, it tries to explain what's doing, uh, doing the reasons why it's selecting. So machine learning can be a black box. It makes a recommendation. And thereafter, explainable X, uh, AI often tries to explain why it arrived at that outcome with that. You can also do it another way. Sometimes it even substitutes it. Once we know how it's doing, then we use explainable AI and we throw away the black box uh, uh, way of uh, doing it. So it's just a step for understanding our, our patterns uh, in it. But what is explainable AI and can it help us uh, a little bit? Well, what we did a while ago, it's already three years ago, uh, you know, it always takes a long time before you get things published uh, with that. We designed an experiment and the experiment was actually a very simple experiment with that. What we did is we give decision makers, they should make a decision and we give them a recommendation with machine learning on the one hand and business rules on the other hand. You know, machine learning, eh, it takes some input data, it learns from it and it gives a prediction that is the right answer. And often you uh, add an accuracy to it eh, from uh, why it's doing in that way. The business rules, it's the rules, eh, if then type of rules with them, they also make uh, a certain uh, outcome. So the one is data driven. The other one is based on declarative uh, logic uh, uh, for that. So we took both of them with them. And then we gave P 
people, in this case students, we would prefer to have uh, policymakers, but we were not able to uh, to use all the policymakers in real life for it. So we had to, to use our students for it. And we tested a couple of hypotheses uh, with that. The first one is that the use of algorithms will result in more correct decision. When you look at the bottom of this uh, uh, slide, you see we compared human-based decision making machine learning supported decision making and business uh, rule supported decision making all make a prediction so with human-based decision making there was no automation uh, support with that with machine learning support you get the uh, that students get an overview of what the recommendations of the machine learning were, were and they can say it's correct or wrong and with business uh, rules support decision making it's the same they get also an overview of it's correct or wrong uh, with that well, our next uh, hypothesis was that the type of algorithms would influence the outcome of the decision making. You can understand that machine le learning is more a black box. You only see the outcomes, but with the business rule, you can see the line of reasoning with it. So it's much closer to explainable AI. And that's why we expected also that more transparent algorithms result in more correct decisions and that mistakes would be detected. We put all kinds of mistakes uh, in it. Eh? And what we are try to do is let uh, the students detect the mistakes uh, in it. Then uh, we expected that people with more experience would make more correct decisions than non-experienced person. And that some of the students had experience with this domain. So we already know they have more insight and some students were completely new in the domain. So they had less experience. So we split them into those uh, groups. Then we make an experiment uh, uh, like this that we uh, conduct, conducted and we stopped when we had 30 people in it for each uh, part of it. Even if we had 31 or 32, I think in one area, we just removed uh, them to ensure that we have 30 in each uh, one. Well, what were the results of the experiments? It's a fairly simple experiment uh, with that. But what you can see is that both machine learning and business rules help the decisions maker to make more correct decisions. So if they had support, the decisions would be better with that. If you would have business uh, rules, it even is higher, the number of uh, uh, correct decisions made huh, were even higher. So we concluded that explainable AI would help it uh, with that. When you look at the experience of the decision makers combined with explainable AI, the number of mistakes detected was even higher with that. But what was surprisingly, no one, not a single student was able to find all mistakes in it. So that means even if you have explainable AI, even if you have experienced person, you might not be able to detect all the mistakes in it. And that was a thing we didn't, well, we might have hoped for, but we didn't really expect it to happen uh, over there because it was fairly simple. And we were thinking, well, is it not too simple? Would they able to detect everything? But no, no one was. And even, uh, I can't remember it, I can can I see in the figure? I think in average, it was about from the 30 items uh, they got, they uh, couldn't find seven mistakes in it. So it was quite a high proportion they couldn't uh, uh, find with that. So even all the experienced persons would not able to do it. Well, it's of course with students. I think policymakers who are in the field can do it better, probably uh, with that. But what does this tell us about explainable uh, AI? Is that sufficient uh, or not? And, and in my view, it's not sufficient because experienced persons and explainable AI are better in those kinds of things. So you still need the domain knowledge. You still need the knowledge about the situation that might be crucial. But what will happen when you use AI? Who still have the domain knowledge? Well, you automation more. What happens when you automate more? Nobody knows anymore and has the domain knowledge because you put everything in the computer, in the software. So you're losing your domain knowledge, whereas domain knowledge might be crucial also for understanding the algorithm. So I would recommend to invest a lot in the knowledge of the people that they understand the field, that they go out there, understand reality, how reality is uh, uh, in it, to, to enable the use of AI uh, in it. So 
when we look at what's uh, happening over there, the more data, the more algorithms, the higher the complexity of uh, processing with that, the more mistakes can also be made and the more complex it will be to uh, identify all kinds of uh, mistakes. So how do you know it's working properly? And how is the situation uh, governed with that? And how does it result in your value or better in uh, for the government public values uh, at the end? That's quite difficult uh, uh, for doing it. And governing requires that you make all kinds of agreement, that you look at the relationship, but you have also control mechanisms built in to ensure that everything is working properly with that. So. One of the challenges, and I think what's happening in the AI is when we look at uh, Korlikovsky's uh, structuralization model of technology, duality of technologies, that there's a lot of technologies and the technology is pushed in it and the human agents, they adapt it. But what's happening is that the institutional level is not adapting it. So we are late with measures at the institutional uh, level. We don't have the governance in place. That's why we have also a lot of uh, discussions about ethics. Eh? There are a lot of ethical guidelines. Eh? They pop up everywhere nowadays uh, with that. So they're available, but ethical guidelines are not sufficient because you need institutional measures. Eh? We have separate institutional measures. That's why we have the judge to rule if the elements are, are correct and those kinds of things. But we don't have those institutional measures for AI. We don't often use a separate audit agencies to look at the AI. And then people say, well, let's make it explainable. Well, can you ex expect that citizens can understand the explainable? Somebody on the street, well, I can try to uh, explain my research in layman's uh, uh, term, but I know from my children, they say, daddy, I don't understand a bit what you're talking about in your uh, research. Well, you can't expect that from the ordinary uh, citizens uh, for that. So it's one step too far to expect that everybody can understand it. So you need experts in it. You need institutional mechanisms. And that's typical governance. Eh? Ensure that you have the right governance uh, mechanisms for ensuring that it's working uh, properly uh, in it. And then there's another uh, one I already mentioned it a little bit. Eh? Transparency. Uh, transparency is good. Everybody wants transparency. Uh, you agree on that. Eh? Nobody will deny that uh, we need transparency with that. I, I never met somebody who uh, denies the need for transparency. But creating transparency might be the most difficult thing uh, that might be uh, happening uh, for that. So what we also try to do in our research is to look at what factors affect transparency. And Ricardo uh, Mateus, he found many factors affecting uh, transparency. And then in one of his uh, um, forthcoming uh, papers, he also found uh, out that it's quite difficult and that you often to create transparency because if you want to create full transparency, it might not be efficient. You need to need weeks or months to analyze it and to create some transparency because you need the domain knowledge, you need to understand everything with that. So it's a trade off with efficiency uh, with that. I didn't include this paper uh, uh, yet, but it's an important uh, reminder because we might be able to create transparency, but it might take a lot of efforts and people don't simply have those efforts. And it also assumes that people have a lot of knowledge about the situation. Well, often they don't have knowledge about the situations uh, for that. So you can't make the expectations that they do it in uh, that uh, way. And that's why I prefer to talk about trustworthiness uh, with that. And trustworthiness is refers to the properties uh, with a trusted entity uh, with that. And trust the entity can be a person, can be an institution or whatever with that. And trustworthiness is often enabled by a complex situation with all kinds of institutional actors for that. It's not that we use AI, but that we have also auditors or looking at the AI that we designed in a proper way, that we put post all kinds of requirements on the AI and they are taken into account. So we can post a requirement like transparency. The question is for whom it will be transparent. I don't think for the public, but it can be transparent for some of the experts. I have a lot of students who are happy to look at the AI algorithms to analyze it, to scrutinize it and to understand it a little bit. 
And the trustworthiness is about the reliability and the integrity and that the outcomes are correct of them. It con con contains all kinds of uh, things. But uh, trustworthiness also acknowledges that the social tech. Eh? Trustworthiness is uh, not only about uh, technology, where you would go to the uh, more AI community, they talk about trustworthiness and they view it very close to reliability. Where you look, we did, an, uh, um, uh, we did a literature review of trustworthiness in AI and trustworthiness in uh, public administration. And trustworthiness in AI, they look more about reliability, about the hard aspects uh, related to that. And public administration, they look more at uh, the trust, communications, and those kinds of aspects. And those communities are separated. And we think with the trustworthiness, the term should bring them together when they uh, understand it. So it's a way to uh, overcome the two uh, communities and uh, connect them uh, with each other. And the good news is that also in the EU, EU they talk also about trustworthiness uh, with that. And they de even define it. They say from trustworthiness, AI should be lawful, compliance with the regulations, it should be ethical, respecting ethical principles and value, and it should be robust. So they acknowledge that it's organizational and a technical part, although this is a little bit high level because ethical uh, also differs among uh, communities and if you it in different ways, uh, the same as robots. So they give also some key requirements uh, in it from how to create trustworthiness AI. And luckily they say we need human agency and oversight. Yes, the governance with that. But we need also the technical robustness and safety. Of course, we need that. But we also need privacy and data governance uh, into account. We need some level of transparency. That's my uh, translation with that. And they translate transparency as traceability mechanism to understand how it was at the end. And that's quite difficult, traceability, because you know, machine learning and they or be enforcement uh, learning, eh? you often adopt your models based on the learnings, based on the outcome, you improve them. So the model that you're using today might be different from the model that you're using yesterday or for the previous decision making. Well, that seriously hampers traceability. It's very uh, challenges, uh, challenging with that. Well, then they say it's uh, diversity, non-discrimination and fairness is uh, needed. It should be for the societal and environmental uh, well-being. And at the end, they say it's also accountable, uh, responsible and accountable uh, for the outcomes uh, with that. And accountability is also such a difficult uh, term uh, with that because accountability you can have in front huh, to ensure that's properly uh, designed. You can have it afterwards when the decisions uh, are made. Well, what I experience is that often when you use um, AI, and when I look at the AI projects, I, I, I see is that a lot have a technology push. We have a solution, it's called AI. We have some uh, techniques for that, and we're using that for that uh, solution. Instead of we have a problem, we're going to analyze the problem, we look for a possible solution, what's the best way uh, for dealing with it. So there's a lot of technology push. And I think that's also the problem with the first example. It was a technology push because we can connect the data. We can use algorithms. Let's use them. And we have some nice outcomes. But what problem does it solve? What did we want to uh, encounter? What values do we adhere to? What were the requirements with that? Well, as an engineer, uh, you shouldn't be uh, doing that. Eh? You should have a structured, systematic problem solving uh, process uh, that we uh, included uh, for that. When you look at the uh, uh, governance, eh? governance is quite difficult uh, for that. It's about authority, rules, it's about accountability uh, for that, and it's scattered also. And sometimes you're quite happy that our society is functioning uh, so well, but there are also some problems with the governance of our society for that. Well, it's the same with AI. You need some level of overview, else you can't have a governance for that. So you need to name a system uh, view to understand the dynamics and it starts. And you need to have the scope, the boundaries of the system big enough with that, because you need to include the data, but also the outcomes, the output, but also the outcomes on the longer term, because it might on the long term also have an uh, effect that you don't desire. So view it as a kind of policy making also, with the whole cycle from the beginning till the end 
is included. And think it also about something that needs you need to know the humans involved, the algorithms, the data, the systems, and the materiality of the governance is very important, eh? including the power division, what's the power, the responsibilities, and those kinds of things, eh? governality is very uh, important. So it contains many aspects uh, for them. And the more that we don't know anymore where the data is processed and uh, the algorithms are used, etc., that add to the complexity. And this is the complexity. Try to follow the balls. Uh, if that's, you, you can follow them, but it shows uh, it uh, increases the, the complexity with that. And what we often do is we find the problem and we patch the system. But that might result just in the next problem by patching uh, the system because it doesn't have a fundamental view uh, to look uh, at it. The question is also who takes the actions? And often it's from outside. Oh, something happens, eh? it's undesirable, uh, let's uh, try to save it uh, for that. But that's fundamental flaw is that you didn't do it from the scratch and you didn't include it into account. You didn't try to make the system that's easier for that. Think about what happened to our business processes uh, for that. Our business processes often grow too complex. And what do we do, do then? We use Lean, Six Sigma, those kinds of uh, methods we use to uh, improve and simplify the business processes. Well, we often don't do it over here with that. We don't simplify it. We just start with the complexity and try to deal uh, with it. So think about the whole system and what the problem you want to solve. And maybe you can do it even without AI, because if you can do it simpler, it's often better with that. And then you have also the risk of what's happening right now from, oh, we have some effects that are undesired. We have the risk of over control, put too many controls in it. And what we, do we call it when we have over control? Bureaucratic, eh? administrative burden, bad tape, eh? things we don't like uh, about the government uh, uh, often. Eh? You don't want that to, uh, to happen because it's also not needed. But that's always the risk. It doesn't go wrong. We introduce a lot of controls. It goes the other direction. We have too much uh, administrative uh, burden uh, in it. Um, then one of the problems is also the, the different speeds of the governance. I have to mention this because this is conflicting. AI is working directly eh, at the very fast speed. So AI here in this picture is the lowest level. Whereas law and regulations, somewhere at the top. Culture is even higher at the top uh, AI uh, type of uh, culture uh, with that. So lower regulations work in terms of two, three, four years, maybe even uh, longer, but AI can't wait for it because it's wait, making decisions right now. So there's friction between all those uh, uh, levels. And that's a major problem in the governance for that. So the governance should take into account that friction and how you do it. And you have always three type of uh, governance mechanism. That's the traditional planning and control, the uh, responsibilities in the organizational uh, structure, and you have risk-based uh, time. And sometimes they are combined uh, with that. Well, you have a tendency to focus nowadays on risk-based in uh, AI risk-based uh, governance. But I think that the reason for that is because we didn't include the governance from the start. We just have all kinds of elements, uh, puzzles, pieces of the puzzle, and we put them together and then we find some risk and we try to manage the risk uh, for that. Instead of as we look at the whole system, this is the whole system from the data collection to the use, and then introduce all kinds of governance uh, mechanisms on the system. That's why we put those squares on top uh, of it. You have to think about it. This is similar to a supply chain. Nowadays, it's a data chain or a data network, whatever you want to do it. You should control it also like a supply chain. You want to ensure that it's efficient, effective. It has the right product. Eh? All those logistics uh, type uh, can be uh, added uh, to it. So uh, approach it in uh, that way is very important uh, for that. And when you look at the whole of uh, governance, I don't want to spend too much uh, time uh, on this, because I have to uh, come to a conclusion uh, over there, is from what you often have, uh, you learn from the data. But before you learn from the data, that's at the bottom of this figure, you now have to know the quality of the data and what's worthwhile. Remember the second slide I had today. What is the data collected, how it's interpreted, etc. And are the outcomes valid? And validity is a huge uh, problem uh, over there. And also what's accepted 
yeah, what, uh, what the outcomes are and can we do it better uh, for that. Then you enter it in your daily processes. That's what, what more the engineers doing. Eh? Below is the data scientists than the engineers. They include it in the daily business processes and then administrative staff, they're executing uh, it with that. Well, the engineers don't know the data scientists. Then the people, the administrative staff who use it have no clue about uh, how it works. You see the complexity from people don't have the knowledge anymore. And if you want to know what's worthwhile and what's the value of it, you need to have the knowledge. So we need to know how it's created. So again, you need to know the whole system as taken apart. Also here on the left side are the data sources. Remember, if data sources change, Google flu, also right, your input change, also your algorithmic processing might not be correct anymore. So you need to have all kinds of checks and controls to ensure that if they're changing in the data, you also uh, change the data. You need surface level agreements about the data to ensure that the data is not modified or whatever, that you can trust the, the, uh, the data, the trustworthiness uh, I'm back on it. You need to have all kinds of checks in your process you want to have also the decision to communicate, but at the end, you want to have also feedback because if the person on the right is not happy, you should have feedback. Why is the person not uh, happy? That's very important because mistakes are always made, can be made. But the question is, how can you correct them as fast as possible, of course, and that you have the right mechanism in it. And nowadays, our uh, logistics company are very good in it. Eh? When they buy something online, and I don't like it, they already provide the way I can return it uh, with that. Well, I haven't seen it in this kind of uh, examples. How can I return an AI-based decision uh, for that if I don't uh, read? You understand, it's not returning, but it's about uh, uh, sending a complaint and doing it. And of course, you need to have the role policies, principles, but also culture, uh, your regulations uh, part of it. So people need to be knowledgeable. And that's why I started also with adaptive governance. This is also not static. This changes all the, all the time. If that. That's why you need to ensure that people have an overview, they have the knowledge and also can uh, have their role in this, pro in this process. And you have also to give them the role. If you don't give them the role, people won't understand it uh, uh, for that. So, some consideration for theorizing uh, uh, over there. Well, I emphasize a lot of governance, but governance goes hand in hand with the algorithms and with the AI. One can't, can't do it with the other. And it's likely that different AI requires also different governance. So you have to know them both. And when you don't understand AI, it's quite hard to govern AI. Try it to go on something you don't understand uh, with that. Look at the bird outside, look at what it's doing and try to go on the bird. What you often do, you put them in a cage. But it, I don't know if you make the bird happy when you put uh, the bird in a cage with that because it wants to fly around. So you have to understand it. Then context matter. And you have to understand it and you need more investment in your knowledge and can retain the knowledge. And you need to take into account the broader context uh, for that, all the uh, social technical uh, aspects uh, with that. And think also about the use of AI. Is it really AI that you want to do or automated decision-making can be done in a different uh, way. And that's also the idea behind uh, explainable AI often is that we just use AI for detecting some patterns, but after we want to know, once we know a pattern, from what are the real motivations behind it. And then we want to theorize, uh, of course, uh, that's what scientists uh, like, they like to theorize with that, to understand what are the causal mechanisms uh, behind it uh, with that. Well, take not a, a too narrow view on uh, governance. Governance is quite complex uh, with that. It, it, it changes the, uh, the institutional uh, mechanism that are part uh, of it and ensure also that you can contest the outcomes, that you do sensitivity analysis. But I remember when I did my uh, studies, I always did sensitivity analysis to ensure that if I use something that it goes up or down, I would know the effects. It's the same with the use of AI, use those kinds of things uh, uh, with that. So you need some level of governance, but 
not too much, eh? else it's bu bureaucratic with that, but if you have the appropriate level of governance, you create uh, adaptive, uh, adaptability uh, with that. Well, final uh, ones from also look at the data, eh? ensure non-biased input data with that. If you put data in it, the bias will just be replicated by the algorithms uh, with that. Think about compliance by design, privacy by design, transparency by design, uh, maybe fairness by design, eh? you can do everything by design. Eh? If yeah, the system is working well, eh? you don't need governance. So the better the system is uh, working well, the better it's doing. But no single system is perfect with that. From always try to combine data-driven algorithms with the cause and effect from theory. And I would really uh, advocate over here also to theorize. Eh? Don't use, if you have a paper published and they say from I found the pattern with that, you need to theorize. It's, like, it's an inductive process where you use data. You find some pattern with that and after you theorize with that. What's the pattern uh, with that? Well, explainable AI might certainly help, but also professional knowledge is uh, noted. And I think you should focus on the overall trustworthiness because trustworthiness includes explainability, uh, transparency, reliability, robustness, and those kinds of things uh, uh, with that. And then we have to find our way of the appropriate uh, institutional uh, system. Well, we need a lot of research about it. I give you some clues, but those are only uh, clues about it. We don't know so many things uh, uh, with that. So we need a lot of research and hope everybody jumps uh, here on and uh, starts researching uh, this area. And that is also how I want to uh, conclude this, um, this lecture uh, with that. Uh, do research in this area. We have to find out so much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Janssen. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, that was a very elaborate uh, uh, talk. Thank you for your thoughts. There are a whole bunch of questions on the chat box and let's see uh, how much uh, time we have. Uh, are we okay with going a little over time, Professor Janssen, if we can request you for 10, 15 minutes, if you don't mind? That's fine for me. Okay, okay, okay. So Professor Yogesh, um, with your permission, I'll open up for questions now. Please, yeah, please go ahead, thank you. Okay, all right, great. So, let me, I'm just pulling up the chat box uh, now. So we have a question from Annie Tubadji, who I think is from Swansea University. Uh, so she says, thanks for a very interesting talk, especially from the perspective of discrimination and inclusivity in the AI reality. I was only puzzled about your result about over trust in AI. What kind of participants is this finding based on? Because I have a couple of studies and uh, surveys seem to show the opposite. People are not very inclined to praise AI services. Yes. So I would appreciate if you could explain more about the experimental settings that lead to this result. Yeah, this is a, this is a very good question because it first discusses what AI is. And often people are even not aware that decisions are made using AI. So it's quite hard to evaluate from uh, if you use AI. Uh, almost any uh, government decisions now, nowadays, uh, AI is involved. People accept that and they even don't uh, know it. And there's always a comparison or also for it because they often compare it with people, human-based uh, decisions, and they're very afraid for subjective made decisions by uh, humans, and they think from systems can do it better. So it's also about the framing. This was um, researched by uh, Dom um, in the uh, that's a Dutch uh, magazine. Uh, they always do surveys uh, about it, uh, so surveys about uh, what it is, and they found out that people prefer to have automated decisions using uh, AI over subjective uh, human-based uh, decision because they think it's more uh, rational. That's often also the reason why we use AI. So I was not surprised about that outcome because else we wouldn't have any AI project. Or else if you don't uh, tr trust that you don't uh, uh, use it uh, for that. I can look it up um, 
it's I think it's from 2019, so it's already uh, more than one year uh, old. This one, uh, but it shows a very interesting perspective. The main thing is what I had from that survey is from what it really is AI, and what is it, and uh, why do people think about it? And AI is often a dream, eh? a dream of people. Eh? From uh, you have uh, you have uh, papers about AI for president because AI can make the best decisions given the uh, circumstances. So AI can be much smarter than humans. Uh, uh, that you have those kinds of dreams and uh, future scenarios uh, for that. Uh, so it's a little bit dependent on how you view it. And it's also what you view a bit. The, the example I give at the beginning of Siri, yeah? is that AI that filled over there or were that the humans uh, implementing and using the data and AI that's filled? I think it's the latter, because while I was looking at it and I was thinking, oh, there's so many uh, mistakes made that, yeah, it's a huge technology push and uh, you shouldn't do it in that way. We have much better mechanisms for ensuring the privacy uh, for that. They all were not used. They had a solution, eh? you know, they had a hammer, structuration theory, eh? everything looks like the nail, and this was the nail, and uh, they had a hammer uh, for that. I think they made mistakes, but it's not AI that was the problem, I think. Yeah. Professor Yogesh wants to add something. Yeah, just, uh, Maran, do you think that uh, there is differences according to culture or according to, um, you know, different country and their belief and their norms are different? So some believe, some can trust more on technology than others. And I can see maybe the Dutch trust AI more than probably in other part of Europe or world. So do you think that is a possibility? And there is a, I see there is a research uh, possibility here that testing the AI, same AI in different settings to see that how same technology, same algorithm, perceived differently or same in different settings? I think, I, I don't think culture plays a role in nationality. That's why I'm saying values also differ. Yeah, also the way you value privacy, yeah, you know, it's already different between our neighbors, Germany and uh, the Netherlands. UK is also a neighbor, by the way, but as a C, uh, between it, so that's often we don't consider it. But the, the, with German, there's a seamless uh, change over there huh? with the language. Huh? The language slowly changes from Dutch into German without noticing uh, it when you live at the border. Quite funny to see. Well, it's the same with the values, but Germany has different uh, values and look in a different way. But what I also think it's about the framing, because you think from AI is not. Uh, trusted because you read too many papers about AI and failure and, and a lot of ethical decisions. But I show you my phone, there's a lot of AI in it. And the newest phone has a separate AI uh, chip uh, uh, in it. It's all about AI. Do we trust it? Yes, we trust it. Make it our life better? Yes, it makes li our life better. So it's also about your starting points and the psychology behind it uh, for that. Uh, that's, that's important. If you give a bad example, people will uh, say, I don't like it. If you have make them aware, this is also a lot of AI, they will love it. It's how you perceive it. And that's the problem also with AI. AI is too effect too broad. We talk about AI like it's one thing, but it's not one thing. And, uh, or at least in the AI, there are five streams of AI. I just mentioned two streams of them in this uh, presentation, but there are three other streams with that and uh, you try to do it. So it's such a difficult thing. So we often don't know uh, where we're even talking about it. So it's quite difficult, but there are many research opportunities over here. Also with, uh, I think, culture that plays a role uh, for sure and nationality uh, for that. I can see the opportunities for sure. Yeah. Very interesting, Professor Janssen, that you mentioned uh, the phone and perhaps the humble autocorrect is a very basic implementation of AI or even the, the intuitive words that um, the system seems to tell us when we are typing out a slightly long uh, chat message. 
uh, the, these might be some very basic forms of AI, which today every smartphone has. I mean, can I just add, uh, many of us use Google Gmail, right? And now Gmail comes with um, autocorrect. I mean, uh, when you're writing the email, it corrects your grammar and uh, things. Uh, and, and I think lots of us using it already without questioning. Uh, that's the same AI. So it's again, what kind of AI we are talking about that also matters that if trust would be there or not. So, yeah. And do you know it's AI the examples? A lot of people won't know it. If you go, go, would go here on the street, well, there's nobody because everybody needs to be inside. But if people would, uh, would be there, you ask them uh, how much AI in it, they will think from, oh, you yeah, had a crazy professor huh, in this neighborhood. Uh, <laughs> for that, uh, with that. They are not aware about AI and that we use it in so many uh, elements uh, for, for that. So making it explicit is also very important. I think that's also an important task for us researchers. That's why this seminar series is also very important for them to create awareness and to create an understanding. Uh, that, yeah. Sure, there's a very interesting question uh, about uh, trust uh, from Frederick Boy. So he's asking, can we always, can we or should we always trust the state and the private sector to do the right thing as far as uh, governance is concerned? Well, I think there's only one answer for it. They make mistakes. I can't. Both the governments and, uh, and uh, companies, they all make mistakes. Uh, and is that wrong making mistakes? If you learn from it, Sometimes you need to make mistakes to learn from it. So it's not surprising. With most of the technologies, you, you try to do it and then you fail and you learn from it, you, you improve it. But don't do it on a large scale. Do it in a sandbox or something like that when you want to learn it. But I don't think there's a difference over there. But the main, main difference is that we expect that the government should warrant our... Uh, public values, yeah? privacy, transparency, accountability, equal, equality, and those kinds of things uh, for that. Uh, but it's also dependent on the situation, of course, that we have. And for from companies, we expect that they make a profit, and that they use it for making a profit and enhance it. So it's logical that Facebook uses all kinds of uh, algorithms to retain their users. That's the task. That's how they make the profit. I won't be surprised uh, about uh, doing it. Did they do, why do they do it in this way? Because it's the cheapest way. One of my uh, colleagues, Johan Paulsen, he has uh, made alternative to, uh, uh, to Facebook. Eh? It's blockchain uh, based, uh, completely distributed, decentralized to avoid that you can manipulate it like uh, Facebook are doing it. But that is much more expensive because you need many notes to do it. Uh, you need to, uh, to be clever, understanding those uh, algorithms, how uh, the blockchain works and uh, how to do it in a distributed uh, way. From I had a very hard time understanding what he was uh, doing. Uh, and I think it's quite hard to explain uh, for doing, but there are good alternatives uh, from a technology point of view, uh, for that. and I think he has 30,000 users now and it might uh, grow, but. The problem is also if you want to grow, you have to make it commercial uh, for that. And what happens when it becomes commercial? The goal becomes profit. Uh, so, and that might uh, undo what he uh, he desires. So, there's also, yeah, some uh, trade-off over there. I, yeah, it's difficult, difficult decisions. Uh, is that it is like some professional values are always around. Right? We are researchers, so what are our professional uh, values, eh? replication, replication of research, uh, being very clear in what we do, uh, putting the limitations in it. Eh? That's our professionals. Eh? And if somebody forget it, eh, we will say in a review, oh, please add that to it. Eh? From, uh, that's how a professional community works. It's quite more difficult with how, uh, how companies and governments uh, work because they sometimes also have to make a trade off. So yeah, 
can we ensure it? So that's always trustworthy. No, we can't do it. That's why we need uh, really the checks and controls. That's right. We are running out of time, but uh, I would like to take one last question. Uh, and this question is from Dr. Orpun Kaur, who very interestingly was our first speaker in this seminar series. He's from IIT Delhi, Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. Um, so he's uh, asking, challenge areas like human in the loop, explainable AI has been an emerging area in the space of AI, mainly studies in a more technological perspective. Mathematical solutions are mostly explored right now, but techno-managerial perspectives have not really emerged too much. How do you feel this area could evolve in the e-government or public policy space? Yeah, yeah that's a very good question. Uh, uh, upon, uh, of course, uh, is this a very good question? Uh, what I observe, we have also the human in the loop AI program at our university. Uh, and why do we have it at our, our university and who's embracing it? Well, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, the, 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 the more technical sciences. And it makes sense if you're driving a car or something like that, it's quite easy to uh, ensure that humans can be in the loop when driving a car. What happens if you have a transaction and you make millions of decisions at the same time? So how can you put humans in the loop over there and ensure that you have uh, the control over that? That can only be done if you put the decision back to the, uh, the person. But that also assumes that the persons understand what kind of decision uh, they are making. And I'm, I'm just reflecting on it. Eh? I didn't think about this uh, really uh, for that. I just tried to discuss it uh, loudly, uh, probably what people do uh, when you look at the terms of Facebook, you accept them. So if you put humans in the loop with the data and somebody asks, can I borrow your data because I will give you a very nice advice and I give it to the remaining part of the world, then people will probably say yes, because they get good advice and they don't read, we will give it also to the remaining part of the world the data, uh, the copyright with that. So they can't understand the implications of it. When you do automated driving, it's very clear. Uh, responsibility, you don't want to have any accidents uh, for that. In this digital world, it's much more uh, complex. I think it, we should explore that because it's a very, it's a crucial concept. And how we approach it, uh, but that's not related to AI, but how we approach it, uh, at least in um, the decomposite and this the collaboration with the governments we have, is to ensure that, uh, that citizens and businesses have control of that data and uh, that they are in the loop of deciding who can use it. So you can't have the Siri example we had at the beginning. But that doesn't mean that they understand uh, the consequences and how to do it. So we need research about it and how to uh, arrange it. I don't, that's my reflection on that. Okay, thank you, Professor Janssen. We have a question from uh, Professor Euripides Lokis. He says, my question is, government has to make decisions based on rules defined explicitly by law and not based on rules extracted in a not understandable way from data. They will be illegal? He's asking a question. I saw a paper for using AI in order to employ the appropriate teachers based on previous data. Um, this would be illegal. We should be based on well-defined bylaw criteria is the question he's asking. Yeah, yeah that's also a, a good question. Yeah? But why do we make why do we embrace data-driven solutions if we have already uh, derived it from the data, if we can derive it from the, the, the policies from the law? And the way policymakers make law is that they want to have leeway. And uh, this also, I know in the US it's a little bit different uh, from that, but it's typical Europe that uh, Euro policymakers like to have a law that gives direction but not really tells you what to do. And they don't want to say the how uh, questions. That means if you want to comply with the law, you need to interpret it. And uh, also you have to look at the circumstances for that. And 
that needs to be taken into account. And that makes it so difficult uh, for that because when you look at, for example, the, the, what the lawyers uh, or the judges uh, decide, that might be based on the circumstances. And then you can look at the data of the past from it was decided in the past in this way yeah, that actually happens here yeah, the decision making support for that that lawyers when they have uh, judges sorry judges when they have a case they will be presented a couple of uh, similar cases from the past and the decisions was made and still the judge can say from oh i do something else because it doesn't take the full context into account or they take something else into account or not even uh, more difficult with the law is you often have conflicting laws in a situation. Eh? When you look at uh, companies with the privacy law, but we have also competition law, uh, you have to deal with various laws uh, with that and there's no uniform solution. So it's the interpretation that might be uh, difficult. And that's why people try to use also data-driven uh, solutions for large-scale uh, decisions. It happens uh, everywhere, I'm afraid, because it's often the only way of uh, doing it. If it's a good way, I don't know. Indeed. Professor Yogesh, uh, is it time for us to do our vote of thanks now? Yeah, we can do. I just wanted to say, I mean, one of the domain where actually AI very uh, is being used very fast and uh, you know significantly is a law in um, legal domain. Uh, it's largely applied uh, because obviously because of the rule-based nature of the law domain, it makes actually AI more appropriate for, for them and therefore more and more uh, use has been uh, made. So um, I guess in the same basis where a rule-based or this kind of system is needed, AI could be adapted, but obviously that is, um, that is, that is for future to see. And that's, uh, that's, now over to you, Professor Bhattacharya. Thank you. Thank you. Some reflection. The yes. main thing is in the past, we also collected data huh? and we asked you to fill in all kinds of uh, data and then human did the interpretation and those kinds of things. And we ask for certain type of data to make also the decisions and the input for the uh, decision and then the interpretation was the humans with that and then nowadays we try to do the AI have the interpretation of it and to ensure also that everybody is treated in the same and in a fair way but the problem with also with a fair way is from uh, if your exception for one reason or, or another what is not written in a law we cannot deal with that exception because it's not written in the law and it's, uh, because it's does harm our uh, public values or whatever. Eh? That's what you see when uh, with refugee, refugees, eh? when children got separated or whatever. Well, the policy might be to send people back, but yeah, you can't separate, of course, uh, children from parents or some whatever. So it's highly interpretation and the circumstances uh, for that. And to codify that, I know they try to do it, uh, but who that uh, the complexity is too high to codify it and what happens when the complexity is too high it fails or it makes uh, wrong decisions so the rational approach is also difficult with that so we have to find a balance uh, uh, between between that and i have no answer to it don't misunderstand me with that and i don't think we should be very i think we should be very careful about ai and data driven approaches uh, with that. But sometimes we, it's better to have something than have nothing. Yeah. Okay. Pragmatic, but I'm sorry, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, Professor Janssen, thank you very much for a most informative talk. And also thank you so much for answering all of those questions in a great amount of uh, detail. Um, so I hope we have certainly tickled the interest and curiosity of all of the participants on our talk today. Um, at the peak, I think we had almost 66 participants logged in and some very interesting questions did come through. I must also thank uh, Professor Yogesh, our uh, host for the entire series, Dr. Raman, our co-host for the entire series, all of the participants who logged in and uh, many of whom actively participated. Uh, there were parallel chats uh, going on as well as uh, we were speaking. 
So I certainly think that there is enough food for thought here. I would also like to thank the SIBM Pune infrastructure team uh, headed by Mr. Rajesh Bhagewadi, who have put the entire infra together for our entire series. And uh, last but not the least, I actually have a student team called iSmart. And uh, the task I've given them is that they should snap uh, photographs to the extent possible from the online screens. And usually after that, they create a series of electronic frames, which we share just as a general thank you gesture. So I must thank uh, iSmart as well for that uh, initiative and effort. Uh, it's been a wonderful session, Professor Janssen. Look forward to more such sessions in the future. And uh, I also do hope you can join uh, some of our uh, future sessions on the series. Our next session will actually be on the 10th of February, being delivered by Dr. Emmanuel Mogaji from the School of Marketing, University of Greenwich, UK. Um, and that talk will be on financial services provision in emerging economies and the adoption of uh, AI for that. So I would like to invite um, everyone on our talk today to please join in uh, for our next session as well on the 10th of February. And Professor Janssen, once again, thank you so very much. We are highly honored. Uh, Professor Yogesh, any last thoughts? Yes, please. Yeah, I just, just wanted to thank um, Ryan because I know how valuable his time is, how busy he is. So he's sparing an hour and a half is just, uh, you know, too precious. So thank you so much, Marian. And also, um, you know, you thanked everyone. So I would like to thank you for coordinating the session very well. My so pleasure. Pichaya. My pleasure, Professor. Excellent facilitation and um, coordination. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.